This talk is going to be called, What Do Most Hindus Believe? Now that is an ambitious topic because, um, frankly, there is such a diversity of beliefs within Hinduism. You actually can find atheists and materialists who are Hindus and have a historical precedent for that. It's not just sort of a modern, uh, a modern abnormality, if you will. No, it's, it's right there in the tradition. And you can find those who have very elaborate supernatural beliefs and everything in between. I like to point out that in every tradition you have the full spectrum of people who at the one end take every word literally and at the other end people who see tales about the gods and so forth as being symbolic and meant to teach you some spiritual lesson and you know all shades in between. So what I'm going to talk about today, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is what most Hindus believe. Okay, there is diversity. Hindus who use the word Hindu are making a uh, are making a concession to Westerners. Actually, the word Hindu was a Persian word originally, and it simply referred to anyone who lived down below the Indus River Valley, and uh, Westerners who colonized India, particularly the British picked up on that term and, and used it. What would a Hindu call, a, you know, call his, his or her religion? Sanatana Dharma. That means, if you will, eternal teaching, eternal law, eternal, eternal truths. Don't confuse the word Hindu and Hindi. Okay, Westerners persist in doing that. How do you say hello in Hindu? No, 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 you, I think you mean Hindi. <laughs> um, all right. Hindi is one of the 200 some languages spoken in India and it's, it's one of the most widely spoken along with English. What, so what do most Hindus believe? I'll just use the term Hindu. Hindus believe in God and they believe in gods, okay? You're all familiar probably with the many images, the, you know, the whole panorama of Hindu gods and goddesses. Some of them in human form, some of them in animal form, and so forth, so forth, and so forth. If you ask a Hindu, a practicing Hindu, how many gods are there? You might get, and in fact you might get from the same person, the answer one, or the answer three million or so. Well, what's up with that? <laughs> Tell you exactly what's up with that, something that's extremely interesting. The Hindu belief is that there is only one God. There is one ultimate reality. But God has manifested in infinitely many ways. No matter who you are, where you're from, what your tradition is, what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you are like emotionally, what you are like aesthetically, and so forth and so forth, there is some way that God has, pre has presented himself so that you can find God accessible. It's part of the infinite generosity of God that God has been made manifest in infinitely many ways. Right away a difference with Western religions who you know, gen generally say this is the one revelation of divine word or this is the one incarnation of God. This is a problem that some missionaries encountered when they tried to take Christianity to India. You know, God out of love for humanity became fully human and born among us to teach us. Oh yeah, we know about that. In fact, there are you know, thousands of times. <laughs> are you talking about Krishna? No, 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 no. It only happened once. Oh, so sorry. You don't know about these other times? Let us tell you about these other times. Must have been a little bit, a little bit confusing to Christians who had no thought. Thought, well, yeah, I can understand God becoming incarnate as a human, but didn't that only happen once at one time in one place? And the Hindu reply was generally, you know, God's not so parsimonious as to reveal Himself only one time in one place in one way to one people, and then tell everybody else. Now, you have to just be lucky enough to learn about this, and you have to drop your own beliefs and traditions and so forth. No, no, no. God is infinite, and God has been manifest in infinitely many ways. Different, um, different gods and goddesses 
are embodiments, if you will, of different parts of the divine virtues. Okay? And we will look at it, we'll provide you with a document with images of gods and goddesses and what each one represents. Uh, and it is important, God and goddesses. Okay? Uh, India very much worships goddesses. Okay? Like in the West, the goddess tradition has been sort of buried, sort of shunted aside. Never in India was, was the goddess tradition shunted aside. Most, most Indians, I, I think still to this day, if they're praying to God, are probably praying to Kalima, you know, the great, the great dark mother who protects us. Or if, you're, uh, you know, if, if, you believe, if you are a devotee of Krishna, you'll pray to Krishna. But if someone asks you, oh, you pray to Krishna instead of Kali? No, no, they're all the same. They're all the same. They're just presented in different ways. Okay? When you see the many, many arms in many forms of uh, many, many of the traditional icons of, of Hindu gods, each of those arms will have in its hand some emblem of a power of that God. That's why the many arms, to, uh, to display to you these various aspects of God that are manifest in this particular conception of God. So what's the top one? There's no top one. It's all God. So what are the, uh, wait a minute, what, what, what's a hierarchy here? There's no hierarchy. It really is plurality. Most Hindus believe that the Vedas are sacred. The Vedas are the ancient teachings for centuries, an oral tradition written down, no one's sure exactly when, at least uh, you know, probably a couple thousand years uh, BC, when they were first started being written down, and they are probably much older than that. Traditionally, Hindus have, have said the Vedas are 8,000 years old. Uh, archaeological evidence, you know, whenever you're dealing with very ancient archaeology, you get to a point where things start feathering into stuff that's just not known and the evidence is gone because the trail is cold. Well, the Vedas, we can agree, are very, very old. In all likelihood, we can say that the Vedic religion, that is the religion that follows these, these sacred writings, these sacred teachings, is the oldest continuously practiced religion in the world by far. You know, Christianity, what, a couple thousand years old? A mere toddler compared to how ancient, uh, how ancient Hinduism is. I will assign, and we will discuss later, particular Vedas, uh, particular sacred writings. It's an entire canon, if you will, of various writings that includes quite a few things. You'll read about that in Mary Pat Fisher's book, and it'll be the subject of, of study later. Cyclic time. Time is a cycle. When it comes into being, it eventually comes to an end and restarts. And these cycles of time are very, 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 very incalculably long. Because there are cycles of time, well, you know, if you look at the seasons, you look at the, you know, the turning of the years and so forth, that suggests you know, time can be conceived of as cyclic, as you know, an eternal return. This also basically suggests that whatever dies will be reborn. Okay? This life is part of a particular cycle, if you will. You are born, you grow old, you die, you are reborn, you grow old, you die, and hopefully you are learning with each life. Okay, what are you learning? Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> okay. Karma. Most Hindus believe in karma. Karma is um, yeah, a term much abused in the West. And people say things like, I've, I, you take a look at how the term karma is used on Facebook, for instance. You know, oh, his karma will get him. Or I can't, this guy was so rude to me, I can't wait to see how his karma pays him back. Karma is not punishment. It's not payback. It is not retribution. It is not a judgment. Karma is simply a law of cause and effect. You become a certain kind of person through your actions, through your attitudes, and that has consequences. You either are getting closer to God or you're getting farther away from God. 
and what causes us to suffer. The farther we get away from God, the more we suffer. Okay, that's what karma is about, really. You become, you become what you do. And that either has beneficial consequences or it has really regrettable consequences that you have to learn from. A Buddhist teacher, if I can switch traditions for a moment, uh, Pema Chandran likes to say, whatever nasty lessons you're learning in your life, they're going to stay there until you actually learn what they're trying to teach you. And then you move on. Well, that's actually not a bad explanation for karma. <laughs> right? You are learning what you need to learn. Sanskrit. Sanskrit is a very, very ancient language. Most Hindus, certainly traditional Hindus, believe that Sanskrit is... There's something very, very special about it. The Sanskrit language makes very, very fine distinctions between sounds. The grammar is incredibly complex. If you're, when you learn Sanskrit, you find that, for instance, a consonant, you know, it's a, there are like different forms. You start down here as a k, with whatever, with whatever vowel you can attach from down here. You move all the way up into your mouth, your tongue, your teeth, and your lips, and so forth. And these are all different sounds. There's a difference between, say, karma, which we're just talking about, and kama, which is, uh, which is uh, physical desire. Okay, very slight difference in sound, but very important. M Traditionally, Hindus have believed that these sounds have spiritually significant vibration. That's why you have to get the Sanskrit right, because in fact, the ultimate origin of these vibrations is God. By doing the, the Sanskrit chanting and you know, knowing the Sanskrit and getting the Sanskrit right, you attune your mind to these sacred vibrations. So it's not just an ancient language that's revered the way we might revere Greek or Latin. There is something very, very special about it. Reincarnation, I just mentioned. Of course, we'll go more deeply into that notion. Reincarnation is simply part of the cyclic view of life and part of the notion that we are continuously learning, we are, we are getting closer to God or we're getting farther away based on our karma. The goal is moksha or liberation. You don't want to continue being reborn and reborn and reborn and reborn and reborn. You want to actually finally achieve union with God to get out of this cycle of the phenomenal world, the relative world, the world where you're attached to pain and pleasure and, and death and suffering, you want liberation. Okay? How do you achieve liberation? This phenomenal self, the body, that, that is the self of experience, this body, your thoughts, your feelings and so forth, that's not the real you. The real you is this divine essence that is the core of you. Everything else is just like stuff that's accumulated <laughs> on your essence. When you realize you're not all this stuff any more than you're, you are your suit of clothes, then you realize that in fact that divine spark within you, the Atman, is in fact actually Brahma, that is, is actually God. There is, and this is, you know, very dangerous to say this prematurely, you know, there, there is a basic fundamental identity between you and God. All that is real is God. So the only thing that's real about you is the spark of God manifest in you. Now you want to be careful saying that because, of course, if you too quickly decide, I am God, <laughs> you're going to take all the garbage you've accumulated and start deifying that. And that, of course, is just craziness. That's megalomania. Megalomania is not the goal. R quite the opposite. You see pictures of the god Shiva as uh, the Lord Nataraj, Lord of the Dance, and he's dancing the circle of fire to bring the world cycle to an end. Underneath his foot, you'll see this sort of ugly little human-type figure. He has one foot planted on that, and he is dancing this divine dance to dissolve the world so that the new world can come into being. What is that thing under his foot? The ego. 
The Atman is not the ego. In fact, the ego is distracting you and hiding the Atman from you. Okay? So, Tatvi Asi. I've hopped around a little, I know, but Tatvi Asi. That you are. Okay? You realize finally, you not, not intellectually realize, but you experientially realize that this Atman is Brahma, is God that thou art, okay, as it's been traditionally translated, but it just means that's it, you, you are that, okay. There are many realms of existence. There are beings that are greater than us. There are beings that are lesser than us. There are gods. There are celestial beings. There are demons so forth and so forth and so forth. Everything except, of course, God is in the same boat. We're called in the cycle of rebirth, reincarnation, where our suffering and ignorance keeps us tied to this wheel of cyclic time. But the various celestial beings have come closer to God that we ha than we have, and they can help us because, of course, that's what they do. They're, they're closer to God. They help us. How do you come into contact with them? The various rituals that are very important, whether it's chanting or kirtan, which is uh, kind of, we'll talk about that later and I'll show you some examples. It's kind of a kind of call and response, religious folk singing, in which basically you're singing the names of God. Okay? Those things, those rituals, are all meant to create a portal between the worlds so that this divine world more fully enters into your consciousness. Okay? And so that, you know, if, if, you, want, if you want protection from, uh, say, this or that goddess or whatever, well, what are you doing? You're invoking, basically, an, an element of God an aspect of God and saying this will this will help my life I do that by making a connection through ritual okay Satguru and Chela which means basically disciple how do you master the various rituals and the various things that you want to do in order to pursue a spiritual path most Hindus believe you should have a guru a guru is someone who is very, very accomplished in achieving God consciousness, who will selflessly, not for personal gain, but will selflessly guide you as well in becoming devoted to the guru. You are devoted to God because you are not looking at the guru. You are looking at God through the guru. Uh, it's not uncommon in Indian romances to have the... Uh, a man and woman or the husband and wife or whatever say to one another, I see God in you. Okay. Well, okay, you see God in the guru. Very dramatically illustrated in a way that a way that is appropriate for you. Your guru may in fact teach you any number of things. It may be a musician, maybe a uh, maybe a yogi, maybe this, that, or the other thing, a Sanskrit scholar or whatever. We use the term, we've, we've corrupted, if you will, the use of the term guru in this culture to mean anybody who is a mentor or anybody who is really good at something. Oh yeah, he's my, he's my um, auto repair guru. or He's my financial management guru. That's not what guru means unless that person is also capable of taking on your karma, your bad, your negative karma, shall we say. And, you know, that's, that's, that's just not what it's about. A guru is someone who has achieved a high degree of God consciousness, and so that person can be of great personal help to you. Okay. Ahimsa. Now, most people speaking for Hinduism will tell you that ahimsa or nonviolence is an important belief of Hinduism. It's just not clearly a traditional belief. Gandhi 
teaches ahimsa in the 20th century. You admire Gandhi, you try to practice nonviolence. You know what, but you look back through the older scriptures, you see people making war, you see people being great warriors. Bhagavad Gita, while it has a certain, is great Hindu scripture, while it, while it has a certain um, metaphoric or symbolic message, it's literally about Krishna persuading his friend, you have to go to war. This is your duty. You know, thrown down your bow and arrows and said, I can't go to war against these other people. Some of them are my teachers. Some of them are my cousins. Some of them have been my friends. I can't go to war against them. And Krishna says, yes, you can, actually. And in fact, you must. If you don't do this, this thing you're so reluctant to do, the light will vanish from the world and darkness will overtake the world. So you know what? Get back in your chariot. <laughs>
you know, retirement is a time when you can now, free from your worldly concerns, you can concentrate on studying the scriptures, you can concentrate on devotion, you can concentrate on those elements of your spiritual life. That's what retirement is about. It's the reward for working and conducting yourself well is that you end up able to study the scriptures and you know, practice the rituals and so forth that will now get you closer to God. Final stage is sannyasin. And that's a term you'll encounter in your readings. And that's how many people think of, of Hindus. Oh yeah, those guys with the, like, the symbols painted on their faces and the long matted hair living in the woods and you know, practicing you know, yoga and practicing asceticism and so forth. That is the very last stage. You've, you've worked hard, you've accomplished what you need to accomplish, and then the very last part of your life you spend completely in union with God. Well, last part of your life, then <laughs> you're going to enter your next life in that blissful, sweet, pure state. That's good for you. Another thing that I, I'd like to point out as being uh, part of Hinduism, and Hindu spokesmen might not, might not list this, but, but they would, I think, immediately say, oh yeah, of course, unity and diversity, the union particularly of the sensual and the spiritual. Unity and diversity. If you look at a Hindu temple, you look in Mary Pat Fisher's book at some of the pictures of temples, you see it looks almost like some sort of naturally occurring mountain with all kinds of vegetation growing on it, but all those little items are actually images of the gods and goddesses. There isn't one center of interest. It's brum. It's all these things converging together to form a unified rhythm. There's a big emphasis upon interdependence and interrelatedness. Okay? Uh, if, if you eat Indian food, you might note that there are all kinds of different flavors, and yet somehow it all works together. Not one overpowering flavor, but lots and lots of different elements that all work together. Indian music. Indian music is based on microtones. As we have, you know, whole tones, like say from, you know, from a, you know, a B to a, an A to a B, and then in between there will be like an A sharp or a B flat, well, between the B and the B flat, there's another tone in Indian music. Okay, it's based on microtones. Lots and lots and lots of different tones, which together, in their interrelation, form this beautiful, harmonious tapestry. Okay, so there is unity and diversity. Things don't have to all be made to conform and be one thing. No, it's this great diversity all works together. And this great diversity is sometimes called Layla, which is divine play. Okay, what's God doing? Well, to use an anthropomorphic term, God's playing. Right? What a joyful way to think about existence. This is God playing. Okay? Sensual and the spiritual. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk more specifically about that later, but... I hear this beautiful music, I taste this beautiful food, that can take my consciousness to a state of divine bliss. And that doesn't just mean, oh, a lot of pleasure, or makes me really happy. That means that I can see beyond the senses. Certain kinds of sensual experiences take me beyond the senses. Sex is very often a metaphor for spirituality in certain aspects of, of Hinduism. Okay. I mean, what is sex? It's the blissful unity of, of uh, male and female, or female and female, or male and male. It's this blissful unity. You know, consciousness, you know, pleasure becomes bliss, bliss becomes pure consciousness, and consciousness becomes union with God. How does that happen? Well, it usually doesn't, right? Because you become attached to the pleasure. You have the pleasure if you have this pleasure, but you, this intense pleasure, but you can let go of your ego, then that can actually become bliss. 
oh, I'm in bliss. No, let go of your ego. No I in bliss here. Okay, let that become pure consciousness. And again, let go of the ego and let that consciousness become union with God. Now, and as I say, that's, a, that's when we talk about Tantra, we'll talk about that being a very treacherous and difficult path. You definitely need a guru to do t- Tantra properly. You can't go to Barnes & Noble and get some illustrated book and say, okay, I'm going to do Tantra. Uh-uh. This is uh, it's like playing with plutonium. <laughs> okay? Very powerful forces you're playing with. So, most Hindus would also say that they believe that you have certain duties as part of your dharma, regardless of what particular role you're playing in society. One is worship. You are in worship, respecting and preserving the traditions that are of great benefit not only to you, but to myriad other beings. Observe the holy days. The holy days are formal occasions when you are devoted to your religious calling. Okay? And when you connect with others who are on that path and you all together connect with this divine realm of existence. Rites of passage. Every culture has rites of passage. Do we have rites of passage? Sure. Do we christen babies? Do we have marriage ceremonies? Do we have baptisms? Do we have, uh, do we have funerals? <laughs> Do we have 4th of July picnics? Do we have all kinds of rites of passage. Graduations, that's a big one. You're probably thinking about that one yourself. Graduation is a rite of passage. Rites of passage help to make us firm in our commitment to our dharma. I am ritualistically, I am ritualistically uh, affirming my path. And ritual is important. Uh, even people who don't especially like ritual like Confucius, for instance, he says, rituals are absolutely important if you do it with a proper feeling. You do it without conviction, without feeling, it's useless. It doesn't have any power in and of itself. Pilgrimages. Why? Because there are certain places that have a lot of, a lot of divine power, if you will, that have a, a, a great deal of importance for the history and the practice of the religion. Going to those places helps to connect with this 8,000-year-old tradition. You just didn't pop into your head. It's not something you pulled off the shelf and bought. It's been there for a long time. You go to these important places where important things happened, important, important teachings were given. Okay? Above all, conduct. You must conduct yourself virtuously. Now, what does that include? It includes all kinds of things that appear to be pretty much universal for the morality of civilizations. You treat other people with respect. You have empathy for other people. You understand that they have, uh, they have feelings, they have desires, they have preferences, and you respect that. You don't conduct yourself in a way that is damaging to others or to yourself. It, doesn't, you know, it means that you don't, you don't become a habitual drunkard. You don't uh, engage in sexual violence. You don't overindulge in, in any kind of pleasure. You don't neglect your work because, hey, you know what? People are depending on you. And so forth and so forth. And the purpose of morality is not because somebody's going to punish you if you, don't, if you behave badly. It's because you are setting yourself up for tying yourself more firmly to the wheel of suffering if you don't practice proper conduct. One last thing. What do most Hindus believe? Well, let me tell you a little story. Uh, Joseph Campbell was, um, he's like the the big figure in comparative mythology. You may be familiar with his work, The Power of Myth and various other things that he did. Really interesting guy. I don't know if you've ever seen a film of Joseph Campbell, but basically he had, a, he had this very thick 
accent. I think I believe it was from Brooklyn. It may have been the Bronx, but he had this really thick kind of New York accent, and he looked like a little leprechaun. And uh, you know, not, you wouldn't you would guess that he was some sort of you know figure like Gandalf or something, but he wasn't. He was just you know very kind of like a little little gnome. <laughs> a import, an important 20th century philosopher, a Hebrew philosopher named Martin Buber, was giving a giving a speech. I believe it was at USC Davis. And um, he was talking about, well, his usual themes, you know, which he called the eclipse of God. He said, we can't talk to God. We can't, you know, God's hidden his face from us. We can't find God. And of course, you can imagine, you know, the experience uh, of the Holocaust and so forth, uh, just looking at this historically and said, you know, what, what happened to the covenant? You know, God's absent. God's, God stepped away from us and we're lost and we're in darkness and so forth and so forth and so forth and we, God has hidden his face from us. Well, when the question and answer period started, you know, Joseph Campbell, who was I think a graduate student at the time, he hops up, Mr. Mover, I got a question for you. You said God's hidden his face from us. Well, I just got back from India. Those people look God in the face every day. Buber apparently became outraged and uh, before he could say anything too terribly inappropriate, the, the moderator, uh, calmed him down and went on to the next question. <laughs> Whatever he was going to say, it started with, you can't compare, uh, what, you can't compare Indians with, you know, with our traditions? Yeah, actually, you can. <laughs> but, okay, what do Hindus believe? I think all of that is predicated upon a more basic question, what is it to be a Hindu? What is it to experience the world as a Hindu? And Campbell put it very, very well. Those people look God in the face every day. This divine aspect of existence, this divine aspect of themselves and others, this is always in front of a devout Hindu. This is the way you experience the world, not a conclusion you come to because someone's given you evidence or arguments or whatever. No, this is just, you know, how do I know this floor is here? I'm experiencing that this floor is here. For Hindu, how do I know that God is in everything? I experience God in everything. I'm describing, this is phenomenology, right? This is, this is what it's like to be a Hindu. God is in everything, both the light and the dark aspects, both the blissful and the suffering. It's all, the divine is present in everything. That, that, that belief, or not belief, but that, that way of experiencing the world, I think is what is at the absolute core of being a Hindu.